It seemed the time for sudden endings and overnight changes, not only in America, but baseball as well. Forbes Field, Old Bush Stadium, Crosley Field, and Connie Mack Stadium went the way of Ebbets Field and the Polo Grounds. Baseball was passing into a new age, but for fans who hated to see the grounds of the past torn apart so quickly, there was at least the consolation of selecting a souvenir. The old gives way to the new. Spacious ballparks with a modern look. Jet Age made expansion possible. In 1965, the Astrodome became the first indoor stadium, and by the end of the decade, baseball became international. In Montreal, even the scoreboards spoke French. But the game was still baseball. And Ernie Banks was still Ernie Banks, the ever cheerful slugger of the Chicago Cubs. He never fulfilled his dream of taking the Cubs to the World Series, but every day to Ernie was, in his words, a beautiful day to play baseball in beautiful Wrigley Field. And this day was one of them. Frank Robinson also hit over 500 homers, playing primarily for Cincinnati and Baltimore. And Harmon Killebrew slugged over 500 for Washington and Minnesota. Willie McCovey became the all-time left-handed home run hitter in the National League. Teammate Willie Mays belted 660 homers in the more than 3,200 hits gathered in his brilliant career. And Mickey Mantle with 536 career homers and a record 18 in World Series play. Baseball's class of the 60s accounted for more home runs than any previous decade. But the 60s also had great pitching. San Francisco's Juan Marichal continued in the Giants tradition of hurlers Matthewson and Hubble with six 20-win seasons. Jim Bunning won more than 100 games in each league while pitching a no-hitter and a perfect game. And in 1968, Detroit's Denny McLean accomplished what many thought impossible. He won 31 games. McLean led the Tigers to the World Series that year against the St. Louis Cardinals, defending champs who were seeking their third world title in five seasons. The Tigers had McLean, but the Cardinals had Bob Gibson. Gibson had been sensational during the season, setting a modern-day record with an incredible 1.12 earned run average, including 13 shutouts and a stretch of 100 innings in which he allowed just two earned runs. And in the first game of the series, Gibson was at the top of his form. He tied Sandy Koufax's record of most strikeouts in a single series game, 15. And then he established his own record of 16. And still had one out to go. Number 17. Gibson dominated on the mound, while Cardinal speedster Lou Brock dominated everywhere else. Tiger fans may have scoffed, but soon they too were convinced. In this series, Lou Brock had little trouble tying his own record of seven stolen bases set the previous year. He also tied the World Series record for base hits with 13.
the Cardinals raced to a three-game-to-one series advantage and appeared ready to clinch it in the fifth game, taking an early lead. But the fifth inning would feature a key play involving Lou Brock and left fielder Willie Horton. Baseball's greatest base runner tried to score standing up and was called out. Tiger fans loved it, but the Cardinals couldn't believe it. Suddenly, everything went wrong. The Tigers rallied. Al Kaline, distinguished right fielder and future Hall of Famer, had waited 15 years to play in a World Series, and in the seventh inning, singled in the tying and winning runs. The Tigers then won game six behind Denny McLean, but now faced the invincible Gibson in game seven. It's still scoreless in the seventh inning when Jim Northrup lines one to center that gives smooth fielding Kurt Flood trouble. The moment is fatal for Gibson and the Cardinals as two runners score on Northrop's triple. And in the year in which Gibson and McLean had dominated the headlines, Tiger left-hander Mickey Lolich wrapped up his third series victory and Detroit's first world championship in 23 years.